Hello and welcome to the latest episode of The Brass Junkies. I am your host, Andrew Hitz. And uh, on today's episode, I am going to be joined by three of my knucklehead friends. One of them, uh, who is uh, very knuckleheaded, is my co-host uh, and muse, Lance LeDuc. Lance, how are you? Meh. Well, I'm not really excited either. So there you have it. Uh, so <laughs> we interviewed uh, two trombone players. Uh, two, well, they're known as trombone players and pedagogues and deep thinkers. Really, deep think, yeah. In, in that, not in that order. Um, Wes Funderburg mm-hmm. and Tom Gibson. Uh, two of the most talented people I know in the music business. Um, and but you uh, wouldn't know it by talking to them. Uh, no, in fact. Uh, yeah, and in fact, uh, far from it. Yeah, it's like you know, like good, uh, you know, good hustlers. You know, in a pool hall, they suck for an hour, and then they take everyone's money. They, um, they do that sucking for an hour thing. Like they just don't even really try. They just kind of act like themselves, and then, uh, and then, <laughs> I don't know if anyone's ever met either of them that hasn't <laughs> hasn't underestimated them. <laughs> That's so, true. That's a good point. I think that's the nicest thing I've ever said about either of them. So you know that we really like them because we are being exceptionally mean. Yeah, that is that in is their absence. There is, <laughs> there is, there is a little bit. Uh, I think if I remember correctly, we're mean to them to their faces in the uh, in the interview too. But uh, why, why not? I don't know. It happened more than two days ago, so I don't remember because I'm old. Although Who are I'm you? not. I'm not AARP old, yeah. Which no. uh, which Lance LeDuc here, he got That's his right. uh, official invitation to got the invited. non-secret society that is right. known as AARP. So, Amen. hey, I'll take the discount. I don't care. I got problems, but not uh, <laughs> not the not to the extent that Lance does. So, uh, all right. So we I would like to discount ain't one. Yeah, well, there is that. Uh, we would like to thank uh, our good friends at Parker Mouthpieces for providing the hosting for the Brass Junkies and for my other podcast, The Entrepreneurial Musician. Parker Mouthpieces offers fine, customizable component mouthpieces for horn, trombone, euphonium, and the tuba, including the Andrew Hitz Artist Model Tuba Mouthpiece and the Lance LeDuc Model Euphonium Mouthpiece. You can find out more at parkermouthpieces.com or follow them on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Twitter. So uh, tell the lovely people how they can support us through uh, onesies and uh, through small recurring uh, donations and uh, through subscribing things. Or small things. recurring onesies. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, wonderful people who have already gone to patreon.com and, and uh, are contributing to our podcast. We are very close to having our overhead covered, and so uh, each person who joins, we really, really appreciate it. It makes it a little easier for us to keep the lights on. We don't actually have lights. We're sitting here in the dark, but thank you anyway. For those of you who are contributing, we've got great, great patrons, and if you are uh, so inclined, please uh, go to patreon.com and sign up there. It's easy to do so. It's easy to increase the amount, decrease the amount. You can suspend it for a little while if you want, if uh, your financial situation changes. And if you want to make a more of a sort of a one-time donation or you're in the Christmas shopping mode, you can head to our website uh, at uh, Pedal Note Media. And we have a variety of uh, products that you can buy, coffee mugs and stickers and onesies and t-shirts and all sorts of stuff with uh where there's two different um logos one is the brass junkies logo and the other is a pray for yens uh logo so if you're concerned about yens's plight and you want to uh show your support uh you can head over and and uh do that you can also we have a variety of uh recordings the brass recording project primary among them but andrew and i each have uh discs available so if you're looking for a gift for a brass junkie we have lots of options and uh, thank you to all of you for uh, your continued support of this uh, effort i couldn't have said it better myself lance thank you yeah no thank you i agree that's i agree that's just because i'm equally inarticulate what (laughs) all right so uh without further ado i do uh, we are going to get right to our conversation with uh, our two favorite knuckleheads, with uh, Wes Funderburk and Tom Gibson. And I think I mentioned this uh, right at the beginning of the talk, where there is a uh, 
there is a text uh, stream over the last many years between me, Lance, Wes, and Tom that uh, if that ever saw the light of day, uh, we would, I think, all go to jail probably. Yeah. We well, start- or they would nominate us to run for president. <laughs> Without further ado, <laughs> here <laughs> is our interview with Wes Funderburg and Tom Gibson. And today we are joined by two trombone players that, um, when taken into <laughs> when ta- when taken into account their well their their obvious limitations, um, I think that they've they've done more with less than anyone I know in the music business, <laughs> and that, that is that is well, hey that's my best intro yet, which I interrupted by pointing out it's my best intro yet. Uh, Wes Funderburk <laughs> and Tom Gibson. Gentlemen, how are you today? What's up? All right. Ex- Wes. So Wes, doing just fine. That's Tom. How are you, fellas? Just so you can keep track. Oh, this... <laughs> <laughs> so far, so good. This is going. I is, promise this will be the strangest interview yet. Yeah, this is this is going to be definitely a, a weird one. So awesome, awesome. So we met, we met these two uh, fine, upstanding citizens uh, at the Great American Brass Band Festival uh, sometime around a decade ago or so. And uh, Boston Brass was performing there. Yeah. And uh, these two were performing with the Piedmont Trombone Society. And um, I was actually, I, I had heard of them, and I had heard that they do really cool stuff, and I was excited to, um, to, uh, to see them. And then someone uh, showed up, uh, a friend of a friend showed up backstage with a cooler full of beer, and um, I then did not go. I didn't even hear a single note that they played. <laughs> I, I just, I just sat backstage and drank, and because we were done, and um, and afterwards, I think it was to Wes. I was like, "Hey, man, sorry, I, I missed your set. I was, uh, I was actually back here just drinking beer." And he was like, "It was good, but it wasn't as good as the beer was." I bet. So that was kind of the, that was, <laughs> that was. So you, I thought you guys sounded phenomenal that day, Lance. I think you actually went. Is that true? <laughs> I actually wasn't there. I oh, wasn't you weren't there. And um, I thought they played great. <laughs> that was one of the last gigs before you joined, wasn't it? Yeah, That's I think right. that was, that was uh, like a month before I joined. Yeah, yeah Harry Waters was uh, was there. I think that he cared enough to go and listen. I didn't, um, but I think uh, uh, I, I, beer. Yeah, I believe he did. I've always really liked Harry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot, a lot of a lot of respect for him. Yeah, I bet I bet you do. So yeah, why don't you go be a guest on his podcast? The um so <laughs> he's by one o'clock. He's yeah. <laughs> so Tom, you're <laughs> Tom, you're currently camping. Is that right? No, I'm currently in a in a trailer. At a campground. <laughs> Wait a minute. The jokes write themselves. Where? Where? Actually, this would be a good time to um, if. Te- te- actually, I am. I'm teaching my kids how to sneak into the pool without any parental guidance. I see. <laughs> That's as though you being there would count as parental guidance. Right. I tried to explain that to the gentleman. It's a little early since your kids are, are three and two, but you know, I'm sure it'll be fine. Uh, well done. It'll be it'll be what could possibly go wrong. The, not like, drowning yeah, is it just doesn't a, bother, it doesn't bother you that the lifeguard has a clown mask. Uh, <laughs> or, that, or that my son's name is Stone. Uh, Stone <laughs> Stone Gibson. Hey, that's a good uh that's a good name right there. Hi, I'm Stone Gibson. So if, um, <laughs> by the way, this would be a good time to mention that um, that I'm wondering if Lance has also had these uh, these these ideas before, but I've often thought that if Lance and I both wanted to just permanently leave the music business, well, really in kind of society, um, in like a just a blazing, uh, you know, like just a, a comet shooting across the sky kind of a way, we could do an episode of the Brass Junkies, which was simply reading aloud the group text that the four of us have had for the last yep. like five years <laughs> running or something like that. <laughs> which would bad idea. Which <laughs> bad would, idea. Which would uh, I, that that would do on. it. That would do it. I'd need a thesaurus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So let's start with um and and uh so Tom, where where are you not camping but in a trailer uh, at a campground? Almost on the border of Alabama. I'm in a little town called Bremen, Georgia. Bremen, Georgia. There you go. Yeah. I guess there is a small town we didn't play a gig with Boston Brass in because I've never heard of that one. <laughs> so I didn't think there are too many. Yeah, it's, it's pretty small. So, yeah, have you, uh, have, J- Tom, have you uh, gone and checked out the site? <laughs> yes, I've seen all the sites. <laughs> as as our listeners are going to discover, um, there are people like Lance and I and Tom who find uh, Wes Funderburk hysterical, like top one percent. But then there's really no one who's neutral on his humor. Um, you're you'll either turn the, you're either going to turn this episode off, like at most eight minutes in, if you're feeling patient, or you're going to be like that. Wes Funderburk is one of the funniest humans I've ever heard. So, uh, <laughs> sadly, sadly, we get no data. We only know if someone downloaded it. It would be good to know the um yeah when people stop stop listening so um but uh hey it's a one or a zero so they're already here so um wes why don't you uh, tell us tell us where you are sitting as we speak uh very close to the back door (laughs) (laughs) and you, you are located in atlanta georgia correct yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm in a, I'm in Atlanta. I'm sitting on the back porch, uh, hanging out with my uh, beer. The family is inside, and uh, it's a real pleasure to talk to two of my, my favorite people. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> wait, there's three. There's three of us. Oh, uh, wait, wait, wait. Boy, you Man, can't. You got that. You can't get anything past uh, Billy Koa's a lot over there. All right. Um, so, Wes, to everyone's surprise, really, you have uh, found continued success in the music business doing a lot of things, uh, playing, writing, uh, composing, arranging. You do a ton of stuff. Can um, can you tell us a little bit about what you're up to right now? Yeah. Well, currently, um, I teach at Kennesaw University and at Georgia State University in the jazz departments um, and also in the uh, teaching applied jazz trombone. Apart from that, I'm the chief arranger for the Joe Gransden Big Band, which I've been arranging for the last seven and a half years. Uh, and I also have been writing a lot for the Atlanta Pops Orchestra. We, um, I wrote a, an entire Christmas album for John Driscoll Hopkins, who's with the Zach Brown Band. Hmm. Uh, last summer, we did 12 Christmas albums, and I did all the arrangements of the Atlanta Pops. With Tom has uh, been very instrumental in helping with that. And then um, I've got... Eight more Atlanta Pops things are due in about a month and a half for uh, <clears throat> any number of people uh, for the uh, Christmas concert. So I've been arranging a lot, composing a lot, performing quite a bit. It could be performing more, but it, I've found a lot of uh, solace in the uh, basement studio talking to the dogs in the walls. Are you speaking in code? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, so how did you get into writing? Um, you know, I started writing in high school, man. In the, uh, I, I was writing for the marching band, <clears throat> um, little short snippets for like the penalty kicks. I think that's what they call them in baseball or football or whatever is the marching band played for. Um, <laughs> no, they don't do pen- they don't do penalty kicks. They don't do penalty kicks. They don't kick anything uh, in baseball. Yeah, well, but no, I would write little, uh, like little thirty-second snippets, like the uh, theme to Monty Python on the Holy Grail, or uh, whatever it takes, whatever makes the kids happy. Um, but, <laughs> and then, but man, it's 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 been a lot of fun, man. I I do a lot of it by myself. I kind of go by the uh, go by the term the Lone Arranger in my house, and everybody thinks it's funny, but everybody. <laughs> The Lone Arranger. <laughs> I just wait, wait, hold on. If you're if you're really quiet, you can hear a few people clicking the episode <laughs> off. <laughs> yeah, my humor is really all about me making me laugh, and not really. I don't really care about anybody else. Amen to that, man. That works on stage totally. I mean, it works for you. It's worked for. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm a, I, yeah. I'm a. I'm a better than this <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes yes you are yes, yes you, you are. are 
Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Tom, tell us what you are up to uh, uh, for your normal. Uh, your what does your normal day look like? Uh, well, I, I teach also at Kennesaw State University with Wes. I Those teach poor uh, kids. A trombone, a trombone choir. I also teach at University of West Georgia in Carrollton, uh, where I teach trombone. Um, I'm the president of the Atlanta Pops and the uh, assistant maestro, so I've been conducting them more and more. Uh, doing a lot of shows. I just like a show at the Alliance Theater, and I do most of the Broadway tours that come through the Fox Theater here in Atlanta. Uh, also playing Joe Grant's big band alongside Wes. Uh, and uh, just trying to keep myself busy. Lately, been getting into some more and more uh, recording stuff. I'm I'm curious how you two met. How long have you known each other? How did this uh, unholy alliance come about? <laughs> uh, we met we met when I came to uh, Atlanta to to uh, to teach at Georgia State. Wes was doing his master's degree there when I uh, showed up, or actually shortly after I showed up. Sure, yeah, shortly after, yeah. Wait a minute, you don't teach there anymore. What happened? Uh, you know, life. Life. <laughs> um, Redacted. That was a full time. That was a full time uh, tenure track position, and uh, as the playing became more and more frequent, I couldn't do it both. So one had to give. So I decided to uh, just go the adjunct teaching route and do more performance. Hey man, life is all about give and take. That's right. Mostly, mostly take. <laughs> if I have opportunity, I, I, I'll, I'll consider giving. I'm a <laughs> <laughs> you know, at risk of asking a serious-ish question, uh, you two guys, to me, uh, Andrew and I spent a lot of time talking to students about the fact that a portfolio career or a career that has income from a variety of different sources is, is paramount to uh, uh, surviving anymore. And it seems like you two are uh, two of my best examples in terms of folks I know firsthand who do that. Is that a thing that you set out to do? It's a thing that was a reaction or it was uh, what, what kind of thought process went into that? Like how do you cultivate a variety of different revenue streams? If you give me a second, I'm looking up Paramount in my thesaurus. <laughs> While you're there, look up thesaurus. Yeah, don't you? Oh, 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 wait. Oh, that's a good word. A you, good know word. What, you know what I need is, yeah, a, is an alternative word to the word I don't understand. We're, <laughs> yes, we are a pair of mounts, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> okay, someone you know, answer the question. <laughs> so, here, so here's the thing, man. I'll, I'll tell you. I'll, I'll tell you this much, Tom, if you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it has. You know, I think it has something to do with, um, you know, as a, when you're a freelancer and you kind of um, you hate saying the word no to anything. I remember when I moved to Atlanta, uh, I worked in a music store. And a guy came in, it was an older guy, he says, yeah, I run, a, uh, I run a local sort of amateur big band, and you play, ba you play trombone. Do you play bass trombone? And I said, yes. And at that point, at that point, you Googled, <laughs> what does a trombone <laughs> trigger do? <laughs> I think that's what he called me and asked me to borrow my bass trombone. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's I think it's a it's a lifetime of saying yes to everything that comes across your plate, you know. So when someone asks you if you know if you play bass trombone, the answer is always yes if you're you know if you're up for it. But but writing and arranging and and especially taking on this uh, Atlanta pops thing last summer, I was very ill equipped. Uh, my skill set was not in writing for strings and especially being able to tolerate uh, what a viola does. Um, and so, it, uh, but I was, I was really, <laughs> but I think it's, come, you know, being able to find as many revenue streams as possible. It's all, it's all about saying yes and taking new risks, I think. So how do you handle or do you experience a fear of failure? I mean, are you worried that you're not going to be able to pull something off or you just have enough belief in yourself that you just feel like I'm going to figure this out no matter what. It's, it's uh 75% of the first and 25% of the back half there you go. because I'm, I'm, I'm terrified of failure, but like I tell all of my students, uh, that's your best teacher. So I accept it and embrace it. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but it doesn't happen often. 
<laughs> no, but but I got I'm about to no, but, about that. Yeah, no, but I better <laughs> get out of the pool, Tom. Get out of the pool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, I can I can tell you that when I when I bring a new chart in, especially for the recording session last summer, and then anytime I bring in a new chart for Joe's band. Uh, I am I'm terrified that it's not going to sound right. I'm terrified that something's not going to have been transposed or but it, it usually works out because I'm, I'm that anal retentive about getting all the details squared away. But but I'm ready to embrace failure uh, uh, 24 hours a day. I think it's a healthy teacher. Mm -hmm. Amen to that. Well, except for once, it's not fatal. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you're killing me here. <laughs> oh. Sorry, I thought that died. Um, so, how many? So, in your teaching studios, how many uh, private students, or or what? So, what's the weekly schedule look like? What do you guys each do? I, I have uh, ten collegial students, collegiate students, and uh, any number of private students that come and go. Some just coming through town. Some pretty regular. So I, I do probably 12 to 15 lessons a week during the daytime are, hours. What are they hoping to go do? Uh, well, it, that varies. Uh, uh, some of them are, are set on orchestral careers. Tom, um, you there? Yes. Yep. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Oh, I'm, yeah, I, I can hear. Okay, good. I'm the only one that needs to be able to hear there, Wes. So, uh, yeah, Con continue, continue with your, continue with your actually insightful answer, Tom. <laughs> I, I think uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. What was the question? Yeah. <laughs> I believe the question was, why did we ask Wes to be on the podcast? <laughs> so what are your students trying to get out of the, of your, of your lessons other than them ending? Uh, I, that really varies. I, uh, some of them really are set on an orchestral career. Uh, some of them want to, uh, to be commercial players. Most of them, by the time, if, if they spend any time uh, with me at all, um, I try to just open their heads into uh, all the areas they might not have considered and try to make them uh, incredibly uh, stylistically diverse. I, I, uh, I'm a big believer in that. The world's changing every day, and uh, the world needs to do more than ever. I want them to be ready for anything. How do you make them, what, what, what do you, on a week-to-week -week basis or year-to-year, -year, what is it that you do to expose them to as many of those different styles as possible? Well, we basically analyze all music uh, from, from three aspects of uh, tone color, time, and note shapes. Huh. I, see, I half expected that there was going to be a smart aleck answer, so when you came out with an actual answer... I was a little caught <laughs> off guard. You want, to, you want to take a pause? Should we come back in a minute? You want to chew on that for a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize that you were giving a serious answer until the third one. So all I heard was, uh, yeah, it was note shape. That's that's it. <laughs> Before that, I was just kind of <laughs> applying the Tom filter. Time and note shape. And so uh, give us an example of how that would be different in, a, say, a classical gig versus a uh, <clears throat> big band gig. Uh, okay. Um, in, on a classical gig, uh, time, uh, very often uh, when you see two eighth notes written on the page, where that second eighth note comes in the beat uh, in Rossini doesn't have a whole lot to do with where that eighth note's going to come uh, in Basie. I see. And, and uh, tone color, uh, very often the, uh, <coughs> the, the dark round thing you're going for in Wagner is not really going to apply much to uh, Thunderbird. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, articulation and articulations. It, it, it's basically uh, it's just a big analysis of the shortcomings of our notational system, and uh, really being able to look at those dots on the page, um, see way below the surface, and understand that uh, there's there's a thousand meanings for any one given dot, and to give it context, and to think about the myriad ways you can you can shape that note, uh, beginning, middle, and end where you place it in time and what color you want to give it. <clears throat> That's wow, the smartest man. thing I've heard him say in a decade. 
<laughs> and, and uh, you know, when, when you start playing around with that stuff and uh, start being creative, your, your very vivid aural imagination starts to wake up. You start to hear players, you start to listen a little more deeply, which is, uh, you know, the daily goal, listen a little more deeply and get a real appreciation for that. Uh, it, it makes you able to, to go sit in the orchestra and, and match that principal trumpet player or match that principal trombonist if you're sitting second or bass uh, and then run right off to uh, big band rehearsal and uh, fit into a section or be able to blow lead uh, and then go sit on a show where you're playing you know, rock and roll or some kind of old, um, uh, old torch song kind of thing. The, those three basic elements of time, tone, color, and note shapes um, are what allow stylistic diversity. So that's what I preach, and we just do constant analyses. Wow. I'm, I'm stunned. Yeah. That's just awesome. That's yeah. fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, it's all, <laughs> Thanks, man. Thank I'll tell you this much. Uh, <laughs> Wes, just I have said, thank you. Tom, Tom, and, Tom, and, Tom and I have sat uh, side by side for the last, I don't know, 13 or 14 years. Um, I, and I, I've, I've always been um, blown away by the by the way that he's able to blend in every in every way. Uh, doesn't matter what the musical context is. Uh, I've sat second in, in a in a uh, conductor's symposium, sight reading Brahms and uh, Rossini, and he's so good at being able to to find the colors and the right phrasing for all of that, and then sitting next to me in the big band. And still be able to to match uh, brightness and darkness with a with a silver two B like a champ. It's uh it's outstanding. So kudos to Tom for being able to do all of that. So Tom, how, oh, how thanks, did man. you? I, I've always re I've always really loved Wes's car. <laughs> <laughs> hey, are you guys doing a are you guys doing a drinking game <laughs> where depending <laughs> on how many times <laughs> Rossini is mentioned? What is like that's <laughs> two times now that Rossini has been mentioned in twenty minutes. Seems suspicious. But he he is truly my hero. Oh, I, uh, <laughs> hey, Rossini, drink. <laughs> oh goodness. Rossini drinking game. So Tom, how did, is this a thing that you've always sort of thought about, or has it been kind of codified over? The, oh, sorry. I'll, I'll use yeah, different I, words. I didn't mean codified. <laughs> Time or is this an idea? Is that with a, hang on, is that with a C? It's a capital K. <laughs> okay. From the, it's I'm from flipping the through that thesaurus. Mm -hmm. uh, no, <laughs> Which she always actually, takes uh, camping. Uh, truly, it's something that's uh, in, in about the past ten years, I really start started to put a lot of thought into it. Um, because when I first started, uh, you know, college teaching, especially when I was doing the full time tenure track thing. Uh, I was teaching the same curriculum that I was taught. And um, although it helped me land a gig out of school, I was seeing really, really great players with really great imaginations not really run into a whole lot of opportunity. Um, so as opportunities started coming my way, I started to really think about, okay, um, what is it that, that we're doing as we go from, from gig to gig um, that makes us able to do the job and how can I put it into some kind of pedagogy and what is the best way to deliver it? So that if if uh, if somebody has the desire and um, <clears throat> musical imagination, just to try to put as many tools in their toolbox as as possible, to allow them to to uh, go out and do it. Hmm. Mm. Well, I don't care what. So West it's been it's it's been a, a <laughs> there's been a lot of a lot of analysis and thought in in the last ten years or so, uh, just trying to make. Um, the, the modern trombone player. This year I was very, very honored by Jim Pugh uh, to be his wingman on uh, the complete trombonist workshop that he's been doing out at University of Illinois. Um, and uh, strong, I'm going back, going back again next year. He's invited me back again next year. And that's the whole premise of that workshop, uh, which I cannot recommend highly enough. We had, we had so much fun and we had players of all ages and all stylistic uh, interests. Uh, but Jim and I, the whole week, basically just preached uh, exactly this. Um, there's orchestral excerpt day. There's big band section playing day. There's lead trombone day. There's chamber music day. There's solo day. Uh, we spent a whole day just analyzing these styles. And uh, I mean, to sit down and have Jim Pugh uh, teach you about lead trombone playing and section playing 
is uh, is is really an inspiration. <clears throat> yeah, but, but he's he's, he's very to... much of the same. You know, he he's been my hero for a long time because he's one of the few guys that really uh, has proven that you can do it. Um, so I took a lot of uh, I took a lot of guidance from him, and uh, I was really flattered when when um, he asked me to actually join him because uh, I'd always been kind of standing in the shadows and watching him with a whole lot of envy. <laughs> <laughs> like a stalker? Um, yeah, yeah. I uh, I actually bought up a, a, a trailer and parked it in his backyard and didn't tell him. <laughs> 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 and then one day when he heard me uh, not practicing, uh, he came out to find out who I was. <laughs> So one of the other elements of, uh, of I believe, both of your successes is, is, is the interpersonal stuff, the off the stage stuff, the not playing stuff. So how do you think about the interpersonal or the how you present yourself or the networking or the just any of the, the soft skills, as it were? Well, I have a mantra. It's all about the hang. There you go. And uh, I mean, all with a capital A <laughs> and hang with a uh, capital B. <laughs> 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 uh, life, is, life is unbearably long, so to suffer through it, <laughs> you might as well have some fun. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> no, no uh, honestly, it is, it is really, truly all about the hang for me. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's, it's more than anything, the, the relationships and the friendships uh, are, of, uh, are of such value that it's the only thing um, that, that that makes it all worthwhile, in my opinion. And what do you do if you have a, a student, any other? If you have a student that comes through, is kind of a jerk, for lack of a better term. Uh, what do you? How do you try and uh, right the help ship? That yeah. Uh, 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 in what sense? Like, how would they be? Well, I mean, if it's mean? all about the hang and you feel that, the, let's say you have a student who you feel like has a lot of uh, musical potential, but that their interpersonal skills lack, do you address that or you? how do you get at that? Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, uh, yeah, I try to, uh, yeah. Um, but they don't let you I hit them. They, so what do you do? <laughs> well, I'll tell you. You've taught for... Go ahead, Wes. You tell no, me. I was, oh, when I was... <laughs> listen, when, you know... Oh, yeah, Wes is the, here. I forgot. Sorry, I was... I've seen you a little while ago. <clears throat> um, when I have a student that... Uh, <laughs> has a lot of potential that, that you know, wants to play... <laughs> you know, I'll pull the sun. Wait, hold you on. Know, hold on. What You're... <laughs> You're breaking up, Tom. You're still there. Right? Learning a lesson, and uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, we're we're keeping this in because this is funny. <laughs> <laughs> the most important thing to remember. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, whole, I wholeheartedly disagree with that. <laughs> oh goodness! I would say that the one greatest piece of advice I ever got was. <laughs> and if he wasn't lying, he meant it. All right, uh, Wes, would you like? Would you like to? I think he might have did, done. I'm done. Did did done that on purpose because. Tom had spoken for the last eight minutes and it was all articulate and insightful and like helpful and articulate and helpful. And, um, and then, and then Wes, the pressure was on and then suddenly he was breaking up, which is very convenient. So, um, so Uh, Wes, would you like to try again? (laughs) Man, yeah, my connection is a little bad, man. So I'm, uh, I'm doing my best here. Oh, well then that's, that's what, that's what the only thing we ever ask of you. Okay. (laughs) All right. No, listen, I've had I've had students that are um, they're they're less than um, I've had students in the past that have been less than perfect as far as their interpersonal skills go, either because they stay out too late or they want to they they would rather party late and then miss a lesson or miss a class. But I have absolutely no problem pulling somebody aside and dressing them down for an hour and and, uh, kind of. about being a musician that's 
printing out your music, uh, you know, getting the bass. You know, <laughs> what you've got to do, not just to be a, a professional musician, but to be a, to be a grown up. You know, um, I've had to do that a number of times. And I, you know, over the last 20, 25 years that I've been at least freelancing in every imaginable uh, musical situation, um, you know, I have some experience to draw on. So if, if somebody's going to be a jerk in, in my uh, in my lesson or they're just not going to get their stuff done, I have, I have no problem, uh, you know, dressing them down. But I try to do it constructively in, in a positive way. Then I, you know, at the very end, I laugh at them. So they, so they think it's funny, too. <laughs> All right. Now, each of you guys has had um, some cool... Uh, stuff online, uh, an online presence, um, Wes with your videos, Tom with the trauma lessons, uh, interviews, which is actually still your idea and are doing this right now. Um, how did that come about? How did you guys decide to go in that direction? Tom, why did you start trauma lessons and, uh, what, what was kind of the lifespan of that thing? Well, uh, now the domain is gone and all that stuff's kind of lost out there in the ether, but I'll bring it all back together and post it up again one day. But it was that whole idea of everything being uh, all about the hang. <laughs> and uh, actually, Wes was very instrumental in that we, we, when we were just hanging out, uh, doing quartets, trios, and duets and whatnot in, in my basement. Um, some of it we thought was pretty funny and maybe some pretty worthwhile and pretty valid. So we started to roll a camera, and um, I started some little snippets. This was a long time ago now. Um, but ironically, that's how I met Jim Pugh after only like three or four episodes posted up online of those podcasts. Um, I got a call one day from Jim Pugh. He said he was in town and he wanted to he wanted to be a guest on the podcast. And wow. um, how cool is that, that kind of exploded it? Then then we went on and we had, uh, you know, we had so many different guests. Colin was on there. Colin Williams was on a lot. George Curran was on a lot. Wycliffe let me take a camera with him into the studio. Scott Hartman. Uh, Leslie Bassett was a fabulous, oh. unbelievable interview. Spent a day with him and his wife. And, um, learned so much about him, studying with Oliver Messian and <clears throat> incredible stuff. So uh, it made for a lot of relationships. Uh, and uh, it, it's all about the hang. I was having a blast. I'll get back to it. I just got so darn busy. How many episodes were there? Oh, man. A lot. Uh, almost 200. Oh, my yeah, God. Holy lot. moly. <clears throat> So, yeah, I mean, we throw up anything. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, we're not judging. We you got, you guys we are on. Particular, and there was, there was precious little editing. <laughs> <laughs> precious little editing. But I, I've got them all archived, and uh, they'll find their way back up there again. I'll probably put them all up on YouTube at some point because there really is some valuable stuff on there. Some great artists come on and, uh, and really uh, are are so <laughs> confiding and so open and candid. It's awesome. Hmm. Well, we should help yeah. you that. There's got to be a way for us to, uh, if you want help, we should uh, figure out a way to make that work. Yeah. If oh, don't, yeah. Then we I'd never have this discussion. I would love it. Yeah, and you know, there was, um, for when, when Tom started doing those podcasts, uh, he didn't have a theme song. <clears throat> I remember this. And uh, All right. at the time, yeah, at the same time that he started those podcasts, I started uh, another project that I had going on. Now, this would have been about 2006, because uh, my son was born shortly after I started my podcast, <clears throat> and uh, it was called Blog Songs. Oh, right. And, uh, yeah. And it was, it, was a really, it was a really cool thing that I, if I may say so myself, uh, where, but it was, it, was sort of a, it was sort of a thing where I could, I could sit down and write as quickly as I could some of the hardest music for four or five trombones. And I would write it as fast and as high as I could possibly play. And I would just record all the parts, write everything, record all the parts, and upload it to a, a podcast that I had on iTunes. <clears throat> and Tom was doing the, uh, his podcast about the same time, so I wrote him up uh, a theme song. And so that's the theme that you hear at the beginning of his podcast. Um, Tom's Bag of Bones. Tom's Bag yep. of Bones, baby. And, and how uh, many I remember I was, I was do doing that? a master class... Uh, like I was all the way across the country doing a master class and I walk into the room and uh, about 15 trombone players in there started playing my theme song. <laughs> <laughs> that was such a trip. <laughs> hey, thanks for writing us the theme that's, song, Wes. Yeah, whatever. That's what, that's what I knew. Uh, I, I better, uh, I better get a new persona and go lie low. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> 
address how many how many blog songs uh, podcasts were there or are there? They, I ended up I ended up writing I ended up writing about seventy five, and then there was about another thirty or forty that were just sort of um, either solo like solo multiphonic sort of uh, uh, stream of conscious sort of uh, free jazz playing. But I, I ended up having about a hundred and I guess it was about one hundred and twenty five hundred thirty total, um, which was which was really really cool. But I had it. There was a concept behind the block songs, which was it was less about sort of that higher, louder, faster. It, it really wasn't about that. It sort of was about that, but it wasn't totally about that. Um, but what I wanted to do was sort of uh, reach. Uh, I guess I should say right beyond my abilities, and then just do my best in the short time that I allotted myself to play and record them in my own little home studio and then just upload them mistakes and all, if there were any, um, probably very few, if I may say so. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, but no, but no, but, but, but that's the whole concept was just to write it, get it out there and just let the music, you know, be out there for the world to either enjoy or not enjoy. I don't really care because I'm too busy ready to write the next one the next week. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I ended up having close to a thousand or 1500 downloads a month for the year and a half that it was up, uh, on iTunes. It was really cool. So one of, uh, Andrew and my favorite authors is a guy named Seth Godin. And he talks about, you know, you just get up and you make your art and you launch it and you just, you do it a day after day after day after day. So, and both of you had projects like that. What was, when you come out the other side of that or, or anywhere along the way, what's that like? I mean, how did it change you? Did it? How did it change you? Uh, that's a good question, man. There, there's some really, uh, there's some crazy uh, things that happen. Uh, head games. <laughs> yeah, right. You can, you can get very self-aware and uh, very self-critical, uh, and, and I think uh, you have to work your way through that because uh, yeah. when you get to the other side of that, you, you, you are, I think you are more capable of. Uh, really truly being yourself and in my case they're like developing a whole lot of empathy and respect uh for the artists around me who were doing the same well it's interesting yeah, yeah go ahead wes no i was gonna say it's it's um there's there's sort of a, a relief a freedom when you really don't care if anybody likes it or not i mean i guess yeah. that makes any sense at all it it's like sense. once yep. you know once the once the once the note is gone <clears throat> or the the series of notes is has gone on to the, uh, the back of the auditorium. There's not really much you can do about it, so you might as well enjoy what you did. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah. Seth Godin had know, a great... I don't know about you guys, but... Go ahead. I'm sure what you're going to say is going to be just as insightful as like the, the, <laughs> <laughs> the greatest mind that we have uh, today. So go ahead, Tom. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Um... <laughs> That's my cue. <laughs> Two, three, four. I, I don't know about you guys, but in, in the academic environment that we were brought up in, it was very, uh, very common to sit around and uh, and pass judgment on uh, recordings that we would hear. And nowadays, it's even worse with all of these uh, the proliferation of, uh, of YouTube clips and things that are uh, ubiquitous. Um, that is a very, very uh, self-destructive and dangerous habit for players. Yeah. Because um, as you are outwardly projecting your judgments, you are really forming some inner judgments uh, um, that are not conducive to to what music really essentially is. You know what? That, so, that, that, that's a perfect segue because there's a thing that I hoped we would talk about, and this is it. Wes, um, for those of you who don't know, and you should go check it out right now, Wes posted some videos of himself playing a, well, a series of high notes. And yeah. the a thousand and one of them. Section, a thousand and one. Sometimes with a banana. Sometimes with a neti pot. <laughs> um, sometimes with a wife beater. Um, so, and uh, while those were going on, that was the period of time that uh, Andrew and I got to hang out with Wes and Tom a fair amount. And so we were able to talk to him about the comments that were showing up in the the YouTube uh, thread. Can you uh, tell us some about that, Wes? Oh, I've got them open. Yeah. I'm going to read some of them before we're before we're done. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Please, please do. You know, 
here's the thing. Read so, mine. I'll have to try to remember my pseudonyms, but uh, yeah, some of mine were good. One of them is, can you, can you, <laughs> he literally plays a thousand and one high Fs and uh, you have to see this. It's been, this video has been seen over 51,000 times, which I don't know whether that makes me excited for the future or whether we're doomed. <laughs> but uh, well, it, peaked, it peaked at fifty-one thousand like five years ago, so it's not that good anymore. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, but why? Why did you do it in the first place? It was really just sort of an, an exercise, right? I mean, it was just sort of a fun thing to do. It was a fun thing to do, and I, you know, I did it very innocently. That this is like one of the very first videos that I put out, probably the first five videos that I put up, because I thought it would be. First of all, honestly, the first the first thing is it's funny. It really is funny. It's just yeah. ridiculous, it's hilarious. And there was there was no there was no sort of um, pat on the back for myself for being able to do it <clears throat> because before I, I actually did that take, I did six hundred and something. Before that, I was like, how the hell am I going to count all of these? I need to do it again with a system. Mm-hmm. And so I started over, and then I, then I did the next thousand and one. <laughs> but it's a, that exercise in itself is well, it's an endurance exercise. Um, my friend Billy Bargetti over at or all of our friends Billy Bargetti over in Huntsville. It's something he used to do in college, which I found out later. But it just became one of those things where wouldn't it be funny if I did it and then turned it off and see what happened? And the comments that started rolling in were, if you if you if you, if you have thin skin, the internet's not for you, right? So I just, <laughs> so I would just sit back and watch, you know, the, the likes would go up and then the compliments of, you know, you're going to blow an artery, you're going to bust your, you know, all this stuff was going on. And then the real anonymous trolls started sort of uh, <laughs> posting things like, well, you didn't rearticulate every one of them, so you didn't really play a thousand and one of them, which steps up my game. So when I, then I recorded. Oh no! I think someone said um, you did it on a small horn. There's no way you can do it on a big horn. Right. So I, I did it on I did it on my uh, 42B, and I did a thousand and one of them just to sort of say, you know, no big deal. Here it yeah, is. And someone that's that's pretty big, I guess. <laughs> you, got, <laughs> I, you got a bigger horn? I got a bigger horn. I got well, you know. Uh, and then, and then some, and, but I would get all of these, uh, comments from people who were sort of, um, armchair po- pedagogues that would say, well, you're not, you're not doing it this way. So you're not really doing it. YouTube, finally, YouTube user K R Z Y Z M A R C wrote, you, you know, man, putting that much stress on yourself while quite a physical accomplishment in and of itself doesn't mean a lot. I mean, what if you had blown an artery or something? Thank the Lord you weren't seriously hurt doing that. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then he wrote, then he wrote, I would have been, I would have been more impressed and you would probably get more benefit if you had played each tone more sustained, like a quarter length or so, a quarter length. Cool, man. <laughs> It would, str- it would strengthen your, it would, it would strengthen your lip muscles, and you would get more consistent with your breathing. Do another and just hold one single tone and time it. And <laughs> you need to make sure it's a quarter length. I, uh, I don't. That's I a, don't that's a average. professor. <laughs> <laughs> Guaranteed, that's a professor. And where are you tenured, sir? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but another one of my favorites is a guy that wrote FAKE in all caps. He's just going da 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 da. <laughs> <laughs> And you, you say right at the beginning of the video, there's no, there's no reason to do this. This is no value. I'm not trying to prove anything. The description, you, know, like you don't like, even have to hit. All right there. You don't even have to hit play. It says here I am playing 1,000 high Fs in a row. This is gratuitous and a colossal waste of time, but I don't care. Enjoy. That's the <laughs> that's the caption for the video. And um and <laughs> yep. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty special. Uh, one yeah, guy I mean, there, asked, there was, there was a disc- "Can I please post the sheet music for this?" I like that one. <laughs> <laughs> Someone else said, "Can I ar- can I arrange that for two trombone quartet?" I wonder if that's Tom's <laughs> alias. That's that's pretty good. Well, and Wes, you would get into it with them, kind of intentionally goading them on, right? Oh, for sure, absolutely. <laughs> you know, you know. 
the thing is, what I would what I would respond to anybody on any of my YouTube videos, I would respond exactly the same way face to face if they had the balls to do it. So sorry, sorry, you can bleep that out. If they had the you can say face to face. Yeah, you <laughs> you can say face to face. Thank you, Lance. But you know, but I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna back down from defending my my own ridiculous humor to somebody who actually wants to take it seriously. <laughs> that, that's bad. Funnier. Oh, dude. They couldn't have missed. Dude, that's not continuous. You rest between every ten notes and you talk continuously. Get a metronome. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's an expert, man. One guy. That's right. One, <laughs> one guy said at at but, yeah, but, at the six just, minute just, fifty five second yeah. mark, you play an E. <laughs> yeah, I remember that guy. <laughs> Start over. Oh, oh, someone says this is wait, this is fail ish. <laughs> and then and then <laughs> Wes wrote back, fail ish isn't a word. Try again. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I, I will say this, you know, about that video. If there, there wouldn't have been four more thousand and one high F videos afterwards if it wasn't for all of the people who really wanted to just, who, who just wanted to troll, to troll the video. Yeah. Um, and the, I guess the good news is that at some point, anywhere, um, <clears throat> anywhere I go, somewhere, some, some, some trombone player says. Oh, you're the thousand and one high Fs guy, and I'm like, yeah, yep. And I'm I'm happy to go to the grave with that. <laughs> yeah, I would be. That's a great thing. Yeah, it's awesome. Well, and also, by the way, both of you guys just play your tails off. But it's funny how you can get Need known no for, anymore. for being now they they lost their tails. That either you can get you can get first noticed by uh, playing a second installment of this, which is a thousand and one high Fs on a big horn, um, with a um, with a with a banana on your head, um, just because you can. <laughs> um, but then, if anybody bothers, then they know your name, and then uh, then they hear you uh, playing, and it's just like it's jaw dropping the stuff that you can do. So. It's funny how um, you can get noticed for uh, for just having fun and um, and then engaging people in the comments uh, and and uh, yeah I could do I could read every single uh, I could read every single one of these oh the 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 bighorn one is the one where someone said uh, you chipped a note in like the four hundreds you should you should start over if you chip a note that was, that's one of my people take it so seriously i love it i love it good stuff uh, yeah well you know what are you gonna do i mean that's you know i was young i was thirty two at the time i really didn't i didn't know what was going on i just i just wanted to be popular <laughs> <laughs> None of that, none of that even holds a candle to the neti pot. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, explain that. <laughs> oh, I, I well, played a high F while while neti potting. Uh huh. Well, my uh, a friend of mine, uh, Jim Jim Woolbright, who's a wonderful trombone player here in Atlanta. Uh, I told him at some point I was I was using a neti pot because I was having bad allergies, and he he said I'll give you five dollars if you play a high F while you use it, and so I did. <laughs> Revenue stream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> so just kind of precariously, uh, precariously, you know, uh, positioning the camera on the shower head, and then you know, of course, I, I wear a wife beater because I, I really fill it out well, and uh, and then just, just and just on the on the first attempt, just to see if I could actually do it. And apparently, that water running through your nasal cavity has nothing to do with airflow. So there you have it, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and also it's funny and also it's yeah funny. It, some people think it's dangerous but it's not jeez <laughs> oh, <laughs> so um can uh can each of you and uh yeah please notice the uh the qualifier here but can each of you share one of your favorite Boston Brass uh road stories they've both played a bunch with Boston Brass 
over the years on uh, Kenton gigs. Um, and Wes has played a couple of times um, when we were really backed into a corner and everyone else was busy um, for uh, some non-Kenton gigs. And uh, can each of you share a memory from the road that is appropriate for a family values-oriented podcast like The Brass Junkies from Pedal Note Media? Now, I've got a bunch of them, but Tom, I'm going to let you go first, if you want to. Uh, well, um filming the, the ukulele bit uh, <laughs> that's was, right was classic was that's classic right. for me uh, <laughs> but I, I actually came away from that experience with a whole new perspective on live performance because <laughs> the first performance that I did with you guys when the humor started really going south <laughs> <laughs> and, and the, room, the room started the room started to get real quiet. <laughs> I would look at you guys, and you're looking at each other, and you're smiling, and then just going further, <laughs> trying to make it more and more and more excruciatingly uncomfortable for everybody in the place. <laughs> you gotta lean in, I, man. I, you I gotta lean in. Never experienced that before. <laughs> I uh, I fully expected that backstage we would gather and say, "Okay, let's fix that and make sure that never happens again." <laughs> uh, but quite the contrary. <laughs> we were there was there was it high was fives. The there was nothing night. but high, nothing but high fives, and uh, yeah, that was pretty good. But I would, bet we could make it more uncomfortable <laughs> tomorrow night. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I had never even thought of that as being like a valid mode of performance. Now it's like all I want to do. <laughs> so yeah. I remember the first time I did that. I was with the Brass Band of Battle Creek, and I got on. I was on the mic doing something, and something just tanked bad. There's like, this, <laughs> there's like this blowback against your chest, like the air is just sucked out of the room, and it's like that's right. really powerful. I mean, it's like an incredibly right. powerful moment. And, <laughs> you know, you can run from it or just boldly go straight into the middle of it. And, I, yeah, I'm taking a step forward, kids. Let's back, go. Back in the spring. Oh, man, yeah, I, I, will, uh, I, I will forever love you guys for showing me how to just boldly step towards it. Back, <laughs> <laughs> back in the spring, I uh, Lance did a, a comedy songs gig up in Pittsburgh, uh, a really cool venue in like this converted old uh, gymnasium that's attached to the Ace Hotel in Pittsburgh. And uh, he uh, had me come up to, uh, well, obviously to play the tuba. What the hell else would he have me come up to do? Read maybe some slam poetry or something. Uh, no, I play. I did tuba <laughs> that night, and um, and uh, and drums. And the crowd, as frequently happens, you know, the crowd was taking a little while to kind of warm up. And I mean, every song it was kind of like this journey through the. What did you call it, Lance? The title was brilliant and so stupid. It was like the, oh, it's the. Uh... Incomplete and highly biased history of the greatest comedy songs ever written, ever. <laughs> so, and, and they were really good, but the crowd was kind of, a, was just, you know, it was taking a little while to warm up. And it, it was kind of, it was a little bit boomy because it was in this, uh, in this old gymnasium. And so it was after like the fourth tune where the, you could tell they were enjoying it, but they weren't giving a ton back uh, to the, you know, up on stage. And, and Lance said, um, and said, "Hey, can you guys uh, can you guys hear the the words? Okay." And then everyone went, "Yup." And he goes, "Okay, cool. It's just that the songs aren't funny." <laughs> and, the <crowd> <laughs> <laughs> and that actually was it was it was masterful because that was actually what broke the dam. And then like they were immediately like, "Oh, this guy's nuts!" Like, and then and then they were laughing at all the things that they kind of found funny before, but they weren't really showing it. So that was uh, that was pretty good. So um, so uh, Wes. Yeah. Can you? I'll, 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 share, I'll share mine. Okay. There, there could be an obvious one, but let me, let me be sort of uh, brush in general strokes before I give one of my favorite memories. Mm -hmm. You know, um, when I toured, I toured with you guys the, the, the very first time, uh, I guess it was 2007, because it was, I know it was nine or ten days. And that was when I missed my son taking his first steps. <laughs> Which is awesome. That is hilarious. That's really funny. And for, oh, wait, that wasn't the story? And all for a hundred bucks. I could, exactly, <laughs> but I could, I, could, I could sort of print that story with the fact that my son, right before I toured with you guys, you may remember, this is the first time I met all of you guys, and uh, Scott Hartman and David Cutler and all of these guys. Um, my son had actually given me hand, foot, and mouth disease 
this remember. viral infection <laughs> like three days before I was supposed to go on a nine day tour with you guys. So I had like these like pox on my hands and on my toes. My toenails were falling off for like 10 days and it was like the most horrible experience ever. But I was like, yeah, I was going to have a fun time with you guys. Uh, <laughs> what, was, what was really funny was the second year um, was being able to get on the microphone and try to tell jokes to the audience. But even if they didn't laugh, I knew that there were already so many inside jokes and I could just turn around to either one of you guys. It would just we just break up laughing because there was something funny about something that we weren't even talking about. Right. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> but I, I will say this: one of the highlights that happened every year, and it's not necessarily a funny thing, was um, I always felt very uh, not hesitant, but sort of um, it was a real it was a real moment when I had to take the microphone after the first song of the second set, which was always White Christmas. Um, and the way you guys played White Christmas as a quintet at the beginning of the second set was always so beautiful. It was very intimidating to have to go on after that and say anything because you guys are so rock star, so world class, and the way you guys played White Christmas was absolutely beautiful. Thank you for noticing. Right on. <laughs> Wait, that was the end of the story? Oh, also, I told this one joke. <laughs> Oh, no, no. You're oh, not no. telling that story. <laughs> You're not telling that story. You mean the last time we went to Maine? That yeah, no. Not, not yeah, it was New Hampshire, and that was literally yeah. the last time we ever played in that yeah, I think, uh, I think, I think looking the uh, president of the university and wherever we were in Rhode Island and saying, yeah, we were too poor. We couldn't afford a turkey, so we plucked a hamster. Yeah. Isn't that funny, sir? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you uh Baloney only had a first name. And we won't we won't actually say the the real punchline. That was the that was the moment when I just like my eyes got real big and I looked over at JD and and he was freaking out and I like looked over at Lance and then I and for like a few seconds I was like, "Wait, what just happened?" And then it washed over me like we hired him and told him that he should at this very moment walk up to that microphone. <laughs> like this is on this is this is on me. I need a mirror. That's what I need if I'm looking for if I'm looking to attach blame. How about um Lance, should we have him tell the Hardy story? I wish you would. Yeah, tell us the Hardy story there, uh, Wes. All right, so here's the Hardy story. In a in a in a nutshell. Um <laughs> I think we were going in between Louisiana Tech and and uh, uh, Clemson. Wow, how do you remember and, uh, that? We decided. Well, I saw. Well, I saw a billboard that said Hardy's. You know the the the, the chubby uh, heartbreaker or whatever it was called, whatever the hamburger was. The widowmaker. <laughs> the widowmaker. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I thought to myself, because it was Andrew, it was me and you and Lance and Andrea Brown and. Um, the bass Tom. player passed out in the back. Bass player, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What was his name? And uh, Matt. Uh, Matt, uh, Matt, yeah. Matt uh, Stollard. Yep. And, uh, man, but I remember just like, I mean, I'm really in the mood for a Hardee's burger. For some reason, nobody else was into it, but everybody said, all right. So I remember ordering my Widowmaker, <clears throat> and I got, about, I got about halfway into it, and I just started drooling <laughs> while you just, the, the mayonnaise and the ketchup together forming this sort of, and the, and the regret out like saliva just horrible moment came out of both sides of my mouth and i was like man this is just, this is this is the wrong thing to do right now you just drop the rest of the burger in the basket you just like let go of it and i it just dropped it man to the basket of fries. and uh i think i think i immediately went to the bathroom just to you know check my makeup and <laughs> everything was fine <laughs> but once we got into well once we got into the uh, the van man i wasn't feeling right not normal not not even 20 percent and uh i know it was about 10 or 15 minutes later <laughs> andrew i think you were driving i said oh, no i i was driving oh, and i said there's driving. a stop oh my, oh, my god I... rest stop and you said no 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 i'm fine and just after we got past the exit for the rest stop you go yeah i need that <laughs> <laughs> so, I was like, "Sorry, Pat. I'll go to the I, next I, exit." So I, we pull off at the next exit, and what's at the next exit? Another Hardee's. Another Hardee's. <laughs> and I think I think your exact words were, uh, "You got to give it back." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so you borrowed a Hardee's Widowmaker. I, I borrowed a Widowmaker for about a half an hour, and. Uh, <laughs> And, and this is before selfies were popular. I took a selfie after the fact, and it was uh, it was very telling. 
The, well, and I remember because I'm not right either. I remember thinking, I, I need to, I need to be a full part of this. So I followed you into the restroom about two seconds later, <laughs> and then it occurred to me, like what, I put myself in your mind because as soon as you open the door, what you see in front of you is one of the bathroom stalls with the crime tape across it that was out of. <laughs> <laughs> thought, what, what? What now? But fortunately, the, around the corner there was it, another opportunity for you. Isn't which the you were available. isn't so, the road always just well, filled with so many just little nooks and crannies of of. Uh, Enlightenment. The time when I was invented a burger from Hardy. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god, that was a that was a moment. I've forgotten about that one. He I will never forget that. He one. didn't get any late <laughs> late fees on that burger. <laughs> Be kind, rewind. It's still in circulation. <laughs> <laughs> but I, as, as I recall, that that Hardy story made its way into the. Uh, Made it made its way into my comedy act at the uh, Clemson University. I believe it did. Yeah, I think it did too. Yep. Yeah, yeah that'll uh, that'll tell you where Lan- uh, where Lance, what's his name, Wes, that rhymes, uh, where uh, where Wes where Wes used to go on the mic was when he got up there and then just started riffing on a a burger he borrowed from Hardy's for half an hour. I was actually relieved. I was like, oh, okay, this one's not that bad. (laughs) That'll tell you where the bar got set. So, And we never, ever had a conversation that was like, should we let him talk? We were all like, "Oh no, this this is must see TV." Yeah, you know, this is like this is good stuff. Let's see where maybe we maybe we won't be a band tomorrow. Let's find out. Yeah, let's 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 roll the dice. Well, I've 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 always I've always told the, the story, and there's the, there's the one joke that, you know about the veterans, and 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 it's 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 sort of historically uh, sort of in the in the past, obviously. But good, but Andrew, there was there was a moment when I was packing up my stuff at the end of that night. That was my first night telling any comedy to anybody on any stage anywhere in the world. Wow. So, really? And so wait, that wait, Scott, that's what you, with, you, that's what you, that was your opening salvo. Wow. Just, Holy moly. Night, I had no idea. Yeah, it's like, I did, I, I, you know, we should send them I a message. Never, Let's launch all of the nuclear missiles. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> <laughs> I, rem- I remember the end of that night. I was so embarrassed. I couldn't, I couldn't even speak. I was ready to go home. And Andrew, you came back into the band room of wherever we were in Massachusetts or wherever we were. And, uh, and I was packing up my stuff and I remember apologizing to you. And you said, man, when you can make every member of the Boston Bass Brass just cringe, because that was freaking awesome, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh and you goodness. gave me a high five and you said don't do it again tomorrow so, <laughs> that sounds about right I was both good cop and bad cop <laughs> so uh, cringing actually reminds me of our uh, of our dear friend Jens Lindemann and right. um, and 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 the uh, the chop problems of course that he's uh, going through no word on whether Hardy's had any role in that but um, let's um <laughs> Let's start with uh, with you first, Wes, since uh, you're on a roll here. Um, what okay. uh, what advice would you give to um, to to Jens in this uh, in this really just difficult uh, time of need? Uh, dial back the uh, the German accent. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd, I'd recommend long tones. <laughs> like a and, like a uh, quarter like a quarter length or a half length. Uh, a half length, a uh, quarter length, uh, uh, high Fs, okay. um, middle Fs, a thousand and one of them, just a quarter length each one. Okay. Just rearticulate and uh, lots of banana, lots of potassium. Right. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> lots of potassium. Lots of banana. Wouldn't it be incredible if at a year and a half into this that if all that Jens's problem was was a, was a potassium deficiency? That would, <laughs> that would be, that'd be, that'd be really incredible. He's going to be pissed that we didn't have you earlier on the, uh, he listens to every episode, so. Oh, yeah. Hi, Jens. Uh, all right, so uh, Tom, why, why don't uh, this is going to be good? The what your breakdown before of what did you call them? The quarter length notes and then the note quarter length note shapes and all of that stuff was 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 really uh, impressive. Yeah, so, so this is going to be good. Tone color, time, and note shapes. Yeah, uh, they, uh, they, whatever. So um, re- yeah, re- so re- you'll have to re- review the transcripts. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I I do have some some. Uh, a very worthwhile advice, I think, for you, Ian, and, and I'm sorry you're, you're struggling. Um, yeah. But uh, 
there is great benefit to really getting the sound in your head uh, sorted out. So just listening inside your head and turning the volume way up and considering every aspect of this sound and then probably just leaving it there. <laughs> <laughs> That was a good one. Yeah. As Arnold Jacobs used to say, remember, you are always playing one horn. It's the horn in your head. (laughs) (laughs) Right. (laughs) Right. That's pretty much what I'm getting at. That's the one that's most important and the one that people really probably want to hear. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's that's pretty good. That's pretty right, good. So if we, if we want to find you wonderful gentlemen online, what's the best way to do so? Anything you want to plug? Fa- be my Facebook friend. Okay. That sounded a little yeah, desperate, but okay. Yeah, and, you know, Facebook's good. Thunderbone.com is the other one for me, but uh, uh, Facebook is always is always a good place to, at least to hear about the, about gigs, performances, things like that, anything that might be uh, beer-related. You know, I've, I've definitely got a, got a hold on that. Tom, when's your podcast uh, coming back? Yeah. Oh boy! Well, I will, I'll consult with you guys. We'll get it happening. All right. Cool. Well, yeah, man. I think that uh, that actually that went better than uh, than I thought Shots. it was going to, Lance. <laughs> yeah. I'd rather <laughs> I'd rather interview these guys than the best guys in town. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, listen, you guys, you, this podcast is hilarious. I just I didn't start listening to it till about uh. So about a uh, an about ago. a month ago, and oh. it's really I think the first time I listened to it was the Harry Waters one. It was hilarious, man. So you guys keep this up. It's it's really really funny and uh, yeah, yeah rock great to hear the in- Very great to hear the insight of uh, all the great uh, brass performers and uh, and Tom and I and our guests. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! All right, that uh, right. That, that that will. Uh, that yeah, I, I realized like wow, we didn't really get into any trouble, which is why I'm gonna wrap this right now. That will do it for another episode of the Brass Junkies. You've been listening to the Brass Junkies on the Pedal Note Media Podcast Network. If you would like to help support the podcast in order to make more episodes like this one possible, please visit pedalnotemedia.com slash donate for more details. Also, be sure to check out our latest recording, The Brass Recording Project, at BrassRecordingProject.com. The Brass Junkies is produced by Austin Boyer and Buddy Deschler of the Fredericksburg Brass Institute. Executive producers are Andrew Hitz and Lance LaDuke. This has been a presentation of the Pedal Note Media Podcast Network.